for all the day's reporting season moves. James Gerrish from Shore and Partners and the author of Market Matters joins us now live from Sydney. James, welcome to the program this morning. All right, it's been a huge morning, hasn't it? A flurry of results. I know that you're watching a few of them. Let's just delve straight into it. Car sales is the top of your list. They lifted its interim dividend and forecast strong annual underlying earnings growth for the first half. Profits rose 17%, but give us your thoughts on that sector when it comes to people buying cars uh, and spending their money during this pandemic. Yeah, good morning to you. It is a, a huge day on the reporting front, so a heap of companies um, to get through. Car sales is first off the uh, rung today, so they've delivered a, a, a pretty positive update for the half. The market was looking for profit of about $68 million. Uh, for the half. They've delivered 70 uh, sorry, they've delivered 74, I should say. So it's about a 9% beat in terms of market expectations. The divvy at 25 was a beat to the 20 cents expected um, by the market. In terms of guidance, they're customarily vague in terms of guidance. They talk about um, having forecasting moderate um, uh, adjusted revenue growth, um, strong EBITDA and profit line growth. In terms of where the market's at at the moment, the market's looking for EBITDA growth of 19%. So the market's pretty bullish on this, but in terms of car sales, a good result to beat. The stock should be up um, on the market um, today. And it should be, you know, we should be seeing upgrades to full year numbers of about 9%. Okay, that sounds pretty positive. Now, super retail is another one that's come out, you know, just guns blazing from all the spending that we've been doing uh, with stimulus, with the stay at home thematic. We know what's been the driver. Why is super retail, like other retailers in the space, just so reticent to give forward guidance when, you know, the, we've got the CEO of Westpac talking up this economy, talking up, uh, you know, optimism about the economy going forward? Yeah, probably because they're cycling off such a strong period, Nadine. So we've seen it in a lot of the um, retailers um, that have been out so far. So they've you know, they've obviously been buoyed by the pandemic. They've been, you know, they've seen a huge amount of um, uh, sales brought forward. So you think about the environment going forward, the trends are probably improving. So, you know, is a vaccine rollout and a, a res return to normality a positive for the retailers or a negative? Well, in terms of super retail, it's probably um, a negative because they've had such a, a big boost to sales um, from the pandemic. BAPCOR is out with the results today. They're in a similar situation. So, um, you know, the banks, on the other hand, are really leveraged to an improving economy. They've taken it, they've done it tough through the pandemic, whereas retailers have been, been doing it really well. So you sort of have this recycling, I guess, and into those companies, out of those companies have been doing well, into those areas of the market that haven't been. So are you saying, implying that perhaps it is as good as it might get for some of these retailers? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you look at you look at Coles results today. So the result for the half was a really strong um, beat. It was about a five percent beat. But you think about their, their guidance going forward is forward is for flat sales to either even even negative sales growth. So that's what these the the areas of the market the cycling off really strong periods have got to deal with. So the bar's been set really high, you know, during the um, pandemic and our associated spending patterns, that the next six to 12 months is going to be harder. So um, that's why I think you're going to see a lot of, um, I guess, reticence to be providing guidance. And, you know, guidance has been, a lot of them have pulled guidance during the pandemic. Um, so they're sort of um, less keen, if you like, to reinstate that guidance, given the uncertainty is still playing out. Yeah, and James, of course, those retailers need to facilitate all of that spending somehow. EML Payments is out this morning as well. Net profit up 30% on the year and revenue up 61% on the year. Is this just down to all of the spending that we've seen during this pandemic? Yeah, it looked like a reasonable set of numbers from EML. EML. The main point you may mention of there is the top line growing at 60%. Um, the market will like that. So they did revenue of 953 That was up from... Um, you know, um, 59 million in the first half 20. So it's a positive, um, uh, positive update. Um, to Nadine point, this is the company that's actually reinstated guidance. So they've reinstated EBITDA guidance uh, for the full year of 50 to 54 million. The market's already sitting at 53. So the market's already at the top of that um, range. So I wouldn't expect a huge reaction in terms of EML shares today. Although there is a pretty reasonable short position in this um, stock. Um, so I'm not sure whether this result will be enough, but it looks to be in line in terms of guidance at least. 
Let's get into the commodity space. I mean, there's so much interesting stuff happening there. We heard from Evolution Mines. We heard from St. Barbara. Uh, we've also heard from Whitehaven Coal. I couldn't help but notice that Whitehaven Coal was one of the best performers. Uh, I think it was Monday. Um, but this, this, uh, this report, at least at face value, really seems to disappoint on lower um, prices. What did you make of it? What's, uh, what's Peter O'Connor there at Sean Partners saying? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 again, this speaks to the um, whether you're looking backwards or you're looking forward. So Whitehaven for the half produced a loss of $90 million. That was a bit more than um, we were forecasting, which was for a loss of about $80 million. So, you know, that's we're splitting hairs in terms of 10 million in terms of Whitehaven's um, overall um, overall earnings. If you look forward though, they've got, you know, if you plug in spot coal prices at these current levels, then you're looking like um, they're gonna do earnings around 600 million for the full year. So, um, you know, the big concern about Whitehaven coal is the level of debt they've got. They've got $800 million worth of debt in the balance sheet, um, but it can be retired pretty quickly given the resurgence in coal prices. The other thing that's been good in terms of Whitehaven is their cost management. So um, costs have been down half on half. Um, so you know, the, 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 uh, they're performing operationally uh, and now they've got a, a better coal price tailwind should see them have a, a lot better second half. So this looks an okay result for mine, even though they've got a headline loss, which is probably a little bit surprising um, from a market's perspective. Okay, so that is reporting season. We will be hearing from Fortescue tomorrow. Boy, the narrative has changed around Fortescue in the past 12, 13 hours or so. What's the water cooler talk around the office about Fortescue and how this was handled yesterday? I actually got a guy in the office who we nicknamed the water cooler who you don't want to get stuck <laughs> next to the water cooler because you lose, you lose, you lose a uh, half an hour of your time. Anyway, in terms of Fortescue, it's a, um, uh, it was obviously a shock yesterday to see um, that you know, such an experienced COO like Greg Lilliman was um, is departing. So that's that's um, you know put that to um, sort of in the shock bucket. Um, the Ironbridge uh, project, first of all, is a pretty complicated one. So it's a magnetite project. So um, from experienced magnetite projects, typically have you know they're really complex. They're not just shovel and ship sort of iron ore typical iron ore projects. They they revolve around um, processing of ore. So that's why you get a little bit more complexity around those projects and you typically have overruns. You know, 25% cost overrun is pretty significant for Fortescue and I think it's more around the reputational issues, the issues around culture and the, the, the issue that the communications didn't find its way up into senior management and, the, and at board level. So to me that's a reputational hit. If you think about the three miners in Australia, uh, Rio's um, hurting from reputational issues, Fortescue's now got a cloud over it, BHP is coming out smelling like roses and their report yesterday showed that they're the, the lowest cost iron ore producer in the world. So to me that you know that just puts BHP at the top of the pile on the dean. But we'll get more info from Fortescue mm -hmm. um, tomorrow um, when they report results. Yeah, really interesting. Okay. James, thank you as always. Really appreciate your insights. I know it's busy for you as well.